Good morning, everyone. This is Mike Gibbs, and I'm the founder and CEO of Go Cloud Careers. And I'm here today to help you with any type of career questions you have, specifically in the cloud computing arena. Although if you've got a networking question, I'll help you with that too. So if you're looking for your first cloud architect job, your first solution architect job, your first cloud engineer job, your first enterprise architect job, and you want to know how to get there, we are here to help you with this. Let me see if I can get a little closer to the camera and maybe some of the funniness around my shirt will go away today. But apparently um, we're dealing with some tech wizardry and I got a little sparkliness on the shirt. Apologies. So today we're here to answer any questions you have about building your cloud computing career to help you get that first cloud architect job, solution architect job, cloud engineer job, or the tech job of your dreams. So before we begin, I want to tell you about some really exciting things that we're going to do to help you in your career. And a lot of them are free and many of them are even today. So this afternoon, we're going to have a completely free interview session. And if you're trying to apply for your first cloud architect job, I will interview you completely free. I've done 6,000 interviews in my career, and I've hired a fair number of people as well. And I've prepared people by speaking to thousands of hiring managers and thousands of recruiters over the years to know exactly what the hiring manager wants and what they're looking for. So if you want to get your first cloud architect job, cloud engineer job, solution architect job, you got to go through the interview. And I'm going to give you a free interview today, give you coaching. So please sign up in the chat box. And if you don't want to be interviewed today, come and watch anyway, because as they say in the art of war, know yourself, know your enemy, and you'll always be victorious. So know yourself and know your competition and win, win, win. And by win, I mean get cloud hired. So please join us free this afternoon. It's a free service we're doing for the cloud architect community, the cloud engineer community to help you get cloud hired. Now, this afternoon, at some point today, we're going to release a video from a very fine young man. His name is Romanek Ivan Tamba, and he's one of the many students we've got hired by AWS that have absolutely no tech experience whatsoever, and we've helped him get his first solution architect job. He's one of the finest young men you'll ever want to meet. He's got an inspiring story how he came to the U.S. from Cameroon when he was 15 years old, worked a full-time job while he was in college, while he was in college, took my course, and got cloud hired. And Amazon liked him so much that he asked them, could you wait five months for me to start my first day because I want to graduate college first? And they liked him so much, they said yes. So please, this afternoon's Yvonne Tama um, cloud hired video. I encourage you to see it. It's going to show you that any of you can get hired. Just yesterday, one of my students uh, made a social media post till he got his first job at AWS. His name is Jordan Kitko. And uh, he just graduated college too. And he took our program. So no background, no experience. And we're not talking about software engineers here. We're not talking about cloud admins. We're talking cloud architects as their first job. So please see his story this afternoon. Now to help all of you build your cloud competing careers, we're going to do a completely free Azure Solution Architect Expert Bootcamp in June. Azure is making huge strides in the cloud computing space. And realistically speaking, this is one of the most exciting times as we're seeing things shift around on the cloud and it looks like Azure is going to be a major player and we all need to know Azure. So guess what? We're going to do the Azure Solutions Architect Bootcamp completely free. The link is in the description below. Now, lastly, if you want to get cloud hired, my team and I have decided to have a wacky 30% off, which is huge, of our Cloud Architect Career Development Program, our Cloud Engineer Career Development Program, our Tech Interview Mastery Program, and the Tech Career Accelerator, if you're already working in tech and want to maximize your career. So realistically speaking, for about a day's pay for the average cloud architect or the average cloud engineer, we can pretty much get you hired, train you, and build your entire future. That's right. We do it for about one to two days pay for the average graduate. And we don't just get people certified. Hey, anybody can do that. That's nothing. I get people certified in two days if I was concerned about it. But we get our people hired because there's a big difference between having 10 certifications and being on the unemployment line and being hired, getting a six-figure salary or more, and living a good life. And we're here about maximizing your life, maximizing the return on investment capital on every business decision you make. And, and part of that is your education. We want to get you hired. So please, if you're looking to get hired, take advantage of our 30% off Memorial Day class. And, of course, please see Yvonne Tamba's video today. Watch this inspiring young man. And that's just the latest cloud hire video. We got cloud hires every day of the week. But, you know, we're dealing with 20-somethings that have no background, that are just motivated, strong, and capable. We want to show you that anybody can do it, including you. And let me tell you, Romanek Ivan Tambo, special, special guy, and you could do it too. So the reason we're here is to help answer your questions. So bring your questions to us. 
ask questions about how to build your career. And that's why we do it, because the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And I want you to do the right things to get hired. I want to maximize your career opportunities, maximize the speed you get hired, because time equals money. And of course, maximize your salary as well by helping you know what are the high value skills that employers desire that are so critical and in such short supply, they will pay you more as well as the lower value skills, which you might want to spend less time on. Optimize your time like a business would. Put all your time, effort, and money, because there's an opportunity cost. You can only spend your time in one place or money in one place. Put it in the things that deliver the maximum return on investment, and you will have the best career possible. So please bring in some questions about your career. Dylan Bell. Wow, Dylan, I am so happy to see you. 16 years old, building your career already. You remind me of this fine young man, Mitchell, that I coached many years ago. I worked with him when he was 14 years old. Wow, you should see by 24 years old. Incredible career. So, Dylan, I'm super excited to have you here. Thanks so much for coming today. Mohar, Mohan Kumar. Hi, I've completed distance from a, my graduation from a distance mode, and you have six years' experience with customer support, and your package is seven. Please help me get some salary and move into cloud. Mohan, I'd like to help you, but the first half of your question, I absolutely have zero idea what you're even talking about. So, you know, Graduation, I don't know what distance mode is, and I don't know what package of seven is. So I don't know what that means. But here's the good news. It really doesn't matter because you're asking us what you'd like to do in the future. And we can easily tell you how to get to what you want to do in the future, but could you tell me what you would like to do on the cloud? Because the cloud is like an airport. And why, the reason I say the cloud is like an airport, you go to an airport, say London Heathrow, big, huge airport, lots of terminals. You can go to Greece. You can go to Florida, you can go to the Ukraine, you can go to Krakow, Poland, you can go to Istanbul, Turkey, you can go to Dubai, you can go to Hong Kong, you can go anywhere from this airport. And see, the cloud, man, has thousands of different kinds of jobs you can do on the cloud. So when you say what a cloud job, I need to know what kind of cloud job. Is it a cloud architect job where you're a systems designer? Is it a cloud engineer job where you're a system builder? Is it a maintenance job on the cloud that you want, which would be sysops or maintenance? Is it a DevOps job, which is a totally different career for software developers that are going to automate software releases? Is it a big data job on the cloud? Is it an IAM role or identity access management job? Is it a security job or is it a networking job? And I could go on and on and on. And Mohan, I'd love to tell you, but you got to tell me your destination and your goal and destination because that is really the critical key, the destination. So tell me the destination and I can get you there. Kind of like if you said, Mike, I want to go to Athens, Greece. And I'd say, okay, jump on the plane to Athens. But I really don't know where your goal is. And just saying the cloud is kind of like going to the airport. So Mohan, please tell me what you want and I can guide you to get whatever kind of great job you can. And you'll get a lot more most likely than your salary that you're currently at. But, you know, I don't know where you're at. I don't know what package of seven is. I can tell you the average cloud architect earns about $160,000 a year, for example, and a good one easily earns double that. But, you know, I don't know what a package of seven is, um, and I really don't know what goal career you're looking for. So if you can provide that and clarify that, I'd love, love, love to help you. And while we wait for some clarification so I can guide you to the right destination, because I don't want to send you to the wrong destination, you know, Chris, if there's any other questions out there, please let me know. And while you're at it, if you me a hashtag cloud hired for everybody, then I know that you're there. If I had, Mike, I've got 10 years experience as a PHP software engineer. How can you start in cloud? Well, again, I need to know your destination because right now you can work in cloud as a PHP software engineer. Is that your goal? I mean, if you're a software engineer off the cloud, on the cloud, it's the same thing. So what is your real goal in the cloud? Now, I'm going to tell you this. Your goal is not to start in the AWS cloud. Your goal is to start in the cloud because there's multiple clouds out there and they're all basically identical. And 87% of customers currently now have two clouds. And 97% of customers, when surveyed, said by the end of the year or two years, they were going to be on two clouds. So there's no such thing as just the AWS cloud. There is cloud, cloud, cloud. But there's not just the AWS cloud. So again, tell me where you'd like to go. Would you like to be an architect or a system designer, an engineer or a system builder, a developer on the cloud, a big database person on the cloud, a security person on the cloud, a networking person on the cloud? An IAM architect on the cloud, a data scientist on the cloud. There's thousands and thousands of different cool tech jobs you could have. 
so please tell me what you like to do in the cloud. Because it's kind of like that airport. You just go to that airport. If you just jump on a random plane, you're going to go somewhere. And maybe that's fun. Maybe it's fun to go to the airport, put a set of blindfolds on, not know, jump on a plane and find out that you're in Hawaii. That might be really exciting. And I'm telling you, it's probably fun. But when it comes to strategy and planning, I really want to know where you want to go so I can build you that map. Like if you told me you wanted to be a cloud architect, I could tell you what to do. If you wanted to be a cloud engineer, I could tell you what to do. And here's the thing. They couldn't be further, further, further from the same job. And train to be a cloud engineer, nobody's getting hired as a cloud architect. Train as a cloud architect, nobody's getting hired as a cloud engineer. So I think we need to ask you. Now, it looks like in the chat box you put some further clarification. And uh, hopefully from there we can help you. Chris, I think he added some clarification. You want to be data analytics in the cloud. Your goal is to get a remote job. Well, you actually picked the hardest job to get in the entire world. So here's the thing. Cloud architect jobs, relatively easy for us. But data analytics and big data jobs really require a special set of skills. So once we start, we typically get involved in either the architecture side or the data analytics and scientist side. And they're very different. The architects like me are going to be the people that interact at the executive level and ask the customers their business goals, business pain points, and business challenges. And then the data architects will think of where can we get data from? Streaming data, clickstream data. What kind of data can we purchase from the Adobe's out there? Marketing data. What kind of tools can we use to, to play with that data, to manipulate, to massage that data? And what kind of business decisions can we make out of that data? That's what we do on the architect side. But that's a job of extreme executive presence, which is teachable, leadership skills, sales skills, emotional intelligence, ROI modeling, and you'll need to spend a ton of time on that if you wanted to be on the architecture side. It, I, now, on the, on the other side, the tech side, which is probably what you're looking for based upon the way the questions are written, this is something different. This is typically a job where you need a master's or PhD in advanced math, like statistics. This is typically uh, one of the hardest jobs to get in the world because now we're approaching things that are more like data scientists. And to be fair, I have a lot of them come to me because they couldn't get jobs and we're getting them jobs as cloud architects and cloud engineers. And so far, I've had two data scientists come through my program. One works for me now and uh, another one is working as a cloud engineer. I love this background. I love the respect, but understand these jobs are that hard to get. So data science jobs are hard. Lots of knowledge of scripting and Python and probably some R, knowledge of databases, data structures, SQL queries, the huge depth in Excel, and I'm just touch, not even scratching the surface. Huge amounts of knowledge on uh, machine learning and whether they be off cloud stuff like PyTorch or TensorFlow or they'd be on cloud stuff like SageMaker, they're that. So, I mean, huge, great job because this person's going to aggregate data, collect data, do something with it. I mean, it's really, really fantastic stuff. But that's going to be the hardest job you could possibly get in the industry. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Good job if that's what you want to do, but it will be very, very challenging. Now, any of these jobs, to be fair, are not going to be covered in certification. And, uh, you know, we create cloud architect programs. And basically, even our cloud architect program is a good $50,000 program. We only charge, you know, less than $1,000 for. But any of these good data science programs, they're going to be thirty dollars to $50,000. We don't teach one because it's not our expertise. But know that. Know that these data science things are serious. And they're going to require a lot more than just, you know, a little kinesis and Kafka knowledge. They are very serious. So, yes, you can get a remote job. None of these roles are easy to get. They're all the most challenging ones in the entire universe to get. And in many cases, the data analytics roles are some of the lower paid ones in the industry as well. But there are people that love numbers and love analytics. And let me tell you, people like me love those people because we can use those numbers and make better decisions. And if we can make better and more strategic decisions, business be better. So love this world, love this career. It's not me. And it's a great career if you're interested, but please note all those caveats. It's not like a cloud architect where I could put you into a nine month program and I could teach you how to lead, sell, present, design, teach you the network, teach you the data center, get you some extremely good leadership skills, some sales skills, some executive writing skills, teach you, you know, block storage, object storage, file storage, firewalls, and uh, virtual machines, containerization, business applications, and then pitch you to hiring managers and get you hired. This is a deeper, deeper, deeper job. 
this is much more technical and a much, much, much more challenging job to get. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't be interested. If it's your dream, follow your dream. Put your heart, your love, your energy, and go conquer your dream. Hey, wait, when I used to practice medicine 25 years ago, and because uh, I was a nurse practitioner with my own internal medicine office, I decided I was going to work in networking, and I did. And that wasn't easy either. In fact, networking is much harder than the cloud, but I love networking, and I also love the cloud, so it's that. But, you know, that's the key. Do what you love and be passionate about it. I hope I answered your question. And if you want a further question or are interested in different careers on the cloud, let me know, and I can help you with that too. Caro747, so to caveat what you're talking about, don't just focus on which cloud provider you should learn, but you should know what you actually do in the cloud. Well, all, for any career, you need to know what you're going to do in the cloud. That's the most important thing. If you are a pilot, okay, I take off, I land, I change directions, I avert bad weather, I make sure people are safe, etc. I have to be calm and keep the cabin calm. And so whatever the job is, there's always a unique set of skills. So our perception is and always will be. There's no such thing as learning a single cloud if you actually want a job. And here's why. A customer should never use a single cloud. Not at all. So here's the thing. Our perception is learn the cloud, not a cloud provider. Learn the cloud. So how many of you learned how to drive a car? It has a steering wheel, a horn, a key, an accelerator, a brake, maybe a gear shift on it. There's mirrors on the car. There's seats that move forward, backward, and up and down, right? So let's just look at it this way. Now, I could do two things. I could teach you how to drive. And if it's a Honda, a Chevy, a Ford, a Mercedes, a BMW, a Nissan, who cares? It's a car. Or a Caro 747. And, and so Caro 747, we teach our students the cloud. So... Let's give you an example. If I teach you what a virtual machine is, and you know the inner workings of the virtual machine, you understand server architecture and hypervisor architecture and the memory allocation and PCIe pass-through, for example, and single root IO virtualization, the main components of virtualization. Then, if you go to AWS and you see an EC2 instance, you know exactly what it is, how it works, why to use it. You go to Azure and it's called the virtual machine and you know exactly what it is because you've already designed it, learned it, and built it. You go to Oracle, they call it a virtual machine. You go to Google and they call it a compute engine instance. Guess what? It's still the virtual machine. So our recommendation is that you learn the cloud. BGP is the same BGP in all clouds. Object storage is the same in all clouds. As long as you don't call it Amazon Simple Storage. <laughs> Blocks, Amazon, blo Object storage is the same whether you bought it from Dell EMC, whether Google calls it cloud storage, Azure calls it blob, or AWS calls it Amazon Simple Storage Solution or SV. I don't even know where they got that idea, but see, here's the thing. It's the same tech. So going back to our car, this is an elastic rotational vector angular changer. And now you're on another company, and this is a cloud-based uh, 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 Miller Radian adjuster. <laughs> I mean, of course, that would be impossible to learn. But if you just learned it was a steering wheel, you're good. So Cairo 747, I'm focused on saying learn the cloud. And when you know what a network load balancer is, it doesn't matter if it's an Azure load balancer, an elastic load balancer, or a cloud load balancer on Google. It's the same thing. Or one that you got from F5 in the data center 20-some years ago. It's all identical technology. And in fact, the cloud is really, really old network and data center technology that's virtualized. It's the same thing. In fact, the first cloud I actually worked on was 1996. It was called Frame Relay. The next cloud I worked on was in like 1998. It was called ATM. Around 2000, I worked on the RFC 2537 BGP VPN, which is another cloud. After that, my team at Riverstone and collaborated with some people on Juniper and Cisco, and all of a sudden we had VPLS or Virtual Private Land Services, another cloud. So learn the cloud, and you'll be able to work anywhere, anytime. And even better, if you learn the cloud, which is really just the network in the data center, Every time you know a new press release, you know what it is. So when people wonder, I'm like, how do you stay so current? I'm like, well, it's easy. Because, you know, last year, Amazon's Route 53 finally supported DNSSEC, which means it final, was finally ready for secure use. But everybody else did that years ago. Last year, Amazon had a massive press release. We now allow east-west routing, which means routing in between subnets. I looked at it and went, 
why is this a press release? I sent it to 30 or 40 other CCIEs that I saw, and they said, Mike, this is what Cisco did in 1985. I can't believe Amazon's taking credit with a massive press release. Here's the thing. All the old stuff, the new stuff, is just the old stuff repackaged. And when you know the old stuff, and you need to know the old stuff anyway, and here's the reason why. As a cloud architect, what do I do? I develop a plan to take the stuff from the network and the data center of the cloud, which is nothing more than a network and the data center. So learn the network and the data center, and you know the cloud. When you know the network and the data center and a hiring manager asks you about it, they're like, wow, who is this guy or girl? I need them on my team. And we've seen it done and improved it because my students get hired every single day of the week, but that's the key. They know the cloud, not a cloud. And I want you to think about it even more. So as a cloud architect, for example, I need to design something for my customer that needs to improve their business and they need to see me as a trusted advisor. Mr. Client, I believe we can develop a new web architecture that can increase your sales. In order to do that, we're gonna have some virtual machines at the front end of your things, many of them hosted by a load balancer. And this way we can improve performance and availability by getting rid of single points of failure. At the same time, concurrently, we're gonna use multiple application servers front ended by a load balancer. Now, Mr. Customer, you told me that you need to run a tremendous number of transactions, but it's structured data. Therefore, I believe you'd like, you need a relational database. So, which relational databases can work on all cloud? MySQL, Postgres, MariaDB, Oracle's uh, database, or Microsoft SQL. So, and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to use this Oracle relational database because it's going to scale well and it's one of the most popular ones in the entire world. So, I'll teach you that. And then when you describe that to the customer and say, well, we need some read replicas. We're going to add some caching to improve the performance because a lot of the queries are the same. We'll drop in a queue so we'll get some Apache Kafka queue. When you deal with that, your customer knows what you're talking about and they see you as a trusted advisor. Now, if I say, Mr. Customer, here's what we're going to sell you an elastic load balancer, a bunch of EC2 instances, another elastic load balancer, a bunch of EC2 instances. This AWS Aurora, all proprietary. You can't go to another cloud with it. And Aurora read replicas and elastic caps. And the customer says, Mike, are you trying to sell me AWS stuff? Who do you care about? Calculating commissions from AWS or me? But when you use generic terms, it's fine. And even with the best architects I know at AWS, and they have some incredible people. Look, I love a lot of the people at AWS. They do some incredible things. So great, great people there and great, great architects. But they don't talk about call the words elastic either, except in their marketing terms, because they have to be relevant to the customer. So Learn the cloud, not a cloud, and you'll be hired everywhere. And guess what? You'll be paid a lot more, too, because the people will see you as a trusted advisor, and that's what the customers demand. The more trusted you are, the more the customer will listen to you, and the more likely they'll be to buy your product. And by building a name and a brand of only providing what's right to the customer, never wasting the customer's money, and truly delivering exceptional service, the world will come to you constantly. You'll have a huge name. So that's my recommendation. Don't focus on a cloud provider. Focus on learning the cloud. But don't just learn the cloud. You need to know the exact job you want and train for that job. Because if you train for the wrong job, you're still not gonna be employable. And I want you to, I'll give you an example. So I used to practice internal medicine. Went to school for seven years for it. For the last 25 years, I've been doing tech. 25 years. Do I still look like a medical guy you're gonna to come to the office with? Or are you gonna say, hey, wait, I'm gonna to come to Mike for my cloud computing needs. I'm going to go to somebody that's been practicing medicine every single day for my medical care. I would, personally, I'd go to the pilot that was in the Navy, that was a fighter pilot, that had been flying for 50 years. I don't want to go to the pilot who for three years was a dog walker because he loved dogs, then for three years was an elementary school teacher, and after this person got bored as an elementary school teacher, they decided to become a nurse. And when they were done that, they decided to become a lawyer, and when they got bored of that, they became an airplane pilot. That's not the pilot that I want flying my plane, especially if three of the four engines fail or there's bad weather. So focus on exactly the job you want and learn the cloud, not any cloud provider, and you will have more opportunities than you can ever imagine. So that would be my recommendation for you. I'm Bhuvanesh. You're a cloud network architect. Your question is why people don't understand the importance of networking in the cloud. Most are focusing. Okay, so let me tell you this. 
nobody has ever thought about the network ever. So 25 years ago, but I did my first CCIE about 20 years ago. My number is 7417. And that was when the CCIE exam was hard. Before Cisco got tired because everybody kept failing it and they took this really challenging two-day exam and made it a much simpler one-day exam. And uh, so there's that. And you know what most of my time was spent? It was dealing with people that were basically Linux jack of all trades or Windows jack of all trades, people that were doing the network because nobody thought of the network. You know what I found? Outages every single day of the week because nobody understood the network. Now, what we're dealing with here in the cloud is we've got a, two sorts of things. Networking is serious business, and there are incredible jobs for network architects and cloud network architects. I get multiple offers per day, as does every good network architect. Then the cloud network architect is hugely in demand. I've got CCIEs of mine that are being hired by AWS in three weeks of my training that don't even have certifications, and no one cares because we polish them up, and the network people have so much. Besides, the cloud is only a network in a data center. Now, what's going on is because the cloud is silly easy. You know, it was 75,000 pages of reading to do my CCIE. Back when I was a challenging exam. 75,000 pages of reading. The AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional, you can put in a 450 page book, and we did it. And people get past the exam every day on it. So we're dealing with something that's 150 times more complicated than the cloud. And what's going on is because the cloud's silly easy, now you can click three buttons and turn on an instance. Half of the software is pre-made. People are getting into the field that don't know as much. They're not as strong because it's so much easier. And, you know, I see DevOps engineers, and I like DevOps engineers, saying it's okay to use a subnet calculator. No, it isn't. Not because it's wrong to use the calculator, because the CCIE needs to be doing the networking design. Because if the network's not designed right, and the addressing scheme isn't designed right, as you know, we can't do route summarization or aggregation. We've got bad routing, and all of a sudden, we've got bad traffic engineering, and poof, our systems break. So the network is a critically important in the cloud, but it's kind of like the good old days where nobody knew they needed a network until they had a multi-billion dollar outage. And you can even see the cloud providers themselves are struggling. AWS had an eight hour outage due to an impaired network. What the heck does that mean? It means somebody needed to do something. Facebook had like an eight hour outage due to a BGP misconfiguration. Last year, Google had a BGP outage because they made a mistake. So that's how critical the networking is. Billions and billions and billions of dollars lost by people that don't understand the network. So as a cloud network architect, yes, you'll have lots of opportunities. But here's the thing. We cloud network architects can't afford to be engineers. We need to be executives. We need extreme levels of emotional intelligence, leadership skills, sales skills. We have to do ROI modeling. We have to be relevant to the CEO, CFO, CIO, CTO. We need to have leadership skills to run proof of concepts with 50 other people along the way. We've got to be able to show the customer the value of the solution is greater than its cost through an ROI model. And then we've got to deliver a design that's CXO relevant for the CXOs, that's management relevant for the management team, and tech relevant for the engineers. We need good sales skills and good negotiation skills. And that's the key. When people don't have that, they get not taken as seriously. So I can tell you this, you know, 20 years ago, I was a systems engineer, pre-sales engineer, pre-sales architect, whatever you want to call it. I had a CCIA, a single master's degree, a CCDP, a CCNP, a CISSP, back when I thought actually certifications helped your career, except for more than one or two, they don't. But, you know, I had all those certifications and my manager pulls me into a room and he says, Mike, you want, I want to talk to you. And I said, okay. And he says, you know, Mike, you're one of the best network engineers I've ever met. He says, you always know what to do. You're calm. And the customers love you. And he says, but do you know the difference between a $150,000 sales engineer and a $300,000 enterprise architect? And I was like, tell me, tell me, tell me. He says, soft skills, executive presence, leadership skills, emotional intelligence, ROI modeling, things that enable you to make a bigger impact on your customer. My manager says, would you like to go to training? Well, a quarter of a million dollars of training I went through between what the company paid for and what I paid for, and it paid for itself in about 12 months. Now, after that, when I walked into the CEOs and I talked about the network, they were like, oh, tell me, Mike. Oh, my God, I never realized how critical that was. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But it took a lot to learn because nobody thinks of the network Everybody thinks of software, software, software. It's what they can see. But you know what? 
Nobody thinks about how the electric gets into their house until there's a power outage either. Nobody thinks about how water gets in their house and the plumbing until it matters. So, so and you know what? I practiced a little bit of cardiology there for a little while. Nobody thinks about their heart until they have a heart attack too. They eat their bacon, their eggs, their sugar, their white flour, all the bad foods, the butter. Then you got a heart attack and they're like, oh, Mike, what can I do for my heart? I'm like, well, for the last 20 years, what I've been telling you to do is to lose weight, stop smoking, exercise, get rid of highly saturated fat animal products, get rid of refined carbohydrates, et cetera, et cetera. Don't smoke. And they're like, okay, now I'll take you seriously. So I'm with you. I've been there. The, the network is so, so, so critical. If you're not getting the respect you need, learn some of those emotional intelligence, soft skills, kind of the things that are in our tech interview, or, I'm sorry, our, our tech career accelerator program or our cloud architect program. That will be the thing to get the world to see you as the take charge person. It's that it's those things. So try and do that. And then the world will see exactly how important the networking is. It's just about how well you sell it. Great question. I've been there and had those struggles for 20 plus years as this every wonderful networking. Thank you for taking care of the network. Without the network, we've got nothing. You know, you know how critical this is? So I've got a new batch of cloud engineering students. We don't do batches, but we just launched it, so it's like they're all new. You know what we did on the first day? Subnetting. You know what we did on the second day? I explained routing. You know what the third day? We built a little routed network. You know what? This week we're gonna do some BGP, just as baseline foundational knowledge, because that's how critical this is. So. Anybody good in training is really getting the networking because the cloud is just a virtual network in a data center. How do you do it? If you don't know the network in the data center, the answer is you don't. And, we'll, and that's why we see outages every day on the cloud. And that's why people don't understand the cloud and they struggle with the cloud. And then the cloud providers produce something like an AWS advanced networking, which in my mind is a joke. It's, fun, it's not even an intro to 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 a junior level CCNA. And, you know, the Google Cloud Network Engineer one isn't any better, and the uh, Microsoft one isn't. It's just they're designed basically because the cloud's so easy to give you almost enough information to just know how to do things, but not enough. So, yes, I'm with you. The network is the critical thing, and, yes, it is super important. Learn how to position it and, and yourself, and, wow, the world will love you for it. Great question. If you want to focus on governance, risk, and compliance, would that role fall under the cloud? Sure. People need governance, risk, and compliance. Lots of lawyers get involved in these jobs. They, they, they asked what role would that fall under within the cloud? Is there a specific role that it would that yeah, governance? Governance, risk, and compliance, just like it would be off of the data center. Same job. Usually for people that are lawyers or have a legal background, Sometimes there's some security auditors in here, but it's usually people with a legal background. And it's the same governance, risk, and compliance that you'd have in any cluttered data center. It's identical, nothing's changed. And you next what you need to know? The same identical things that you would need to know. So if you're government compliance at a hospital, you might need to know healthcare laws, say in the US we have HIPAA, you need to know about insurance and regulations, the Joint Commission of Hospital Accreditation and all those things, that would be what they would focus on. Now, if you're in governance, risk, and compliance at a bank, they're going to be focused on, say, SEC laws and regulations and PCI DSS and all kinds of things that are related to these things. How long? So, so there's that. If you're in an airline industry, there's going to be some governance, risk, and compliance because we're going to be dealing with the U.S. government, the air traffic controllers, et cetera. So every business has governance, risk, and compliance, and you would be working for the business in that department. And, of course, it would still be on the cloud. Cloud data center, it doesn't change that job at all, not even 1%. Kind of like if you were working as a company as a lawyer. Does it matter if they're cloud-based or data center-based? Not one bit. So that's why I see the question. Same job as always before. The, the cloud is not relevant here. Same thing. Chris, you can go to the next one. And it's a good question. Jose Flores, what a nice name, Mr. Flowers. Love that. So, what is the technical pass for an SRE? So, realistically speaking, once we start getting to these DevOps rails, the path is somebody should really be a software developer first. Then, as a software developer, they need to learn the DevOps tools. Off the cloud, things like Jenkins, Skimpin, or Git, 
cloud-based DevOps tools as well. I mean, we're really talking about literally everything that we need to have from that DevOps perspective. So first become a software developer, and then there's that. Now Terraform, you got to get good at infrastructure as code. There's no way around it because these people do lots of DevOps work. Linux, everything in the world is Linux, so you're going to have to become a good Linux specialist. How to set up Linux, how to script on Linux, how to like bash sale scripting, how to automate on Linux, maybe with some bash or Python. Um, you know, cron tab, you know, parsing through logs, you know, automating. So there's that. But really the key for this career is you've got to be a software engineer first. Now here's the next part. It's not AWS. You need to learn all this stuff off of the cloud. All of it off the cloud. Because that's 90% of what you do. And then, because there is no such thing as just AWS now, you need to know how to use the tools on Google, AWS, and uh, Azure. Because you're always going to be using all three in today's world. There's never a chance where you're just going to use one. So that's why things like CloudFormation templates, I throw them in the trash and I replace them with Terraform, which work on all clouds. Terraform is really exceptionally good. But I'm not a DevOps engineer. We don't have a DevOps program. But what the employers are telling me is they want a software engineer first. They're not looking for somebody that took a DevOps professional exam. They don't want to hire that. They want a software engineer that truly understands CI, CD pipelines and software engineering and software development. Then that person studies DevOps skills. Then they study cloud skills. Then they study Terraform and master it. And then they become an expert on Linux. And that's what it takes. So not a certification job because again, this is a real job and no real job ever gets built by certification. Certification will get to the junior job like help desk. Maybe if you're lucky, but it won't give you any of your professional careers because you need to know more than the name of a service and how to configure it. So that's really your technical path for these things. Become a, make sure you're a great software developer, then learn all the DevOps tools on and off the cloud, then learn Terraform in depth, learn Linux in depth, and make sure you know enough about the DevOps tools on all the cloud providers, and then you should do well. And if you really want to maximize your career, add some soft skills, emotional intelligence, leadership, some scale skills, and it'll help you get hired, and it'll help you get paid much more. How much more? Well, on average, if you train an engineer's soft skills, you raise their salary by about 30%. So if you're dealing with a job that pays about 125 on average, 30% 30, 30 is $40,000. So in my mind, that's a lot. So don't just focus on the technical path. Focus on the other side. It'll be much more valuable for your career. Before we go to the next one, I see the sign is there. So it reminds me to tell everybody about we've got a 30% off Memorial Day discount. If you're trying to get cloud art, take advantage of this and get your first cloud architect job or your first cloud engineer job. We'd love to see you, We'd love to work with you, and we can't wait to get you tell us your cloud hire. Chris, you can bring in the next one. James, I didn't watch the build keynote for Microsoft because, but you know, there I can still tell you all the things that cloud pros need to know because they're the same thing. But what kind of cloud professional, James, are you interested in? Because it's not just cloud, it's determining your career. So what are we seeing? I can tell you right now, it's not based upon what Microsoft says. Who cares what Microsoft says? It's what the customers say. The customers determine what they need. And the customers are telling us, screaming it, we want multi-cloud, we want multi-cloud. And you know what? Just yesterday, Microsoft and Oracle said, we're going to join forces to create higher availability multi-cloud systems together. So that was important. Now, why am I not concerned about Microsoft building this? And I love Microsoft. I think they're one of the best technology companies in the world and one of the most transformational companies in the world. I love them. But here... The customers were screaming for this for years. The customer was saying, no, no, no. I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. Never, never, never. We have cloud networking people. We have networking people, and they know not to use a single service provider. They use two. Because if a service provider goes, you don't want your wider network to be taken down with it. So there's that. Now, what else are we seeing? We're starting to see that people are going to get rid of the garbage services like Amazon Kinesis, SQS, Microsoft Cosmos, good services. Why do I call them garbage services? Because 
they lock you into a single cloud and customers are saying they want both clouds. So think about it this way. Amazon Aurora can't use it. It's trash because it's not, it's proprietary. But we can use Oracle on the Azure Cloud, the Microsoft Cloud, and the Google Cloud all at the same time. Amazon Kinesis, streaming data. Well, proprietary. So get rid of it. Apache Kafka across all three clouds. And the customers are screaming for it and they're using it. We have a cloud formation. It's a proprietary way to configure our cloud. Yeah, that doesn't work in multi-cloud. That's why the industry is screaming for Terraform. So that's what you can see. Now, James, we're starting to see something else. People are realizing that the cloud is not as secure as the network and the data center. It's almost as secure, but slightly less. And here's the reason why. In the network and the data center, you've got a set pattern of attack vectors come in through your internet connection or your employees. That's it, for the most part, or your wide area network, somewhere else, which would be your employees. On the cloud, hack into the cloud, get all the customer's information, kind of like when Azure was hacked into their Cosmos database and like 3,500 customers' information was stolen. Oh, that's a lot of information. So hack into the cloud and get the whole thing, clock into a customer, get it. So look at it this way. Let's say I've got a website that's called mycatcindy.com. My beautiful cat, she's doing her fur, she's chasing her tail, she's bringing me gifts. And anyway, that's mycatcindy.com. And if you hack into that, you get pictures of my cat, you know, playing with her feet in the air, carrying stuff in her mouth, you know, playing with her fur cleaning herself, you know, that kind of stuff. So you get that. You're going to hack into that? No. It's just my cat, Cindy. Hack into Amazon. Get access to all their customers. Shut down their control plane and, and shut down their entire system. You pretty much could shut down Amazon and take down 20% of the internet. A hacker could do that and cause instant harm to us. So there's that. So security, 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 security. And what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean cloud native security. It means big security. It means zero trust. It means next generation firewalls. It means things like what Net Palo Alto is doing in the cloud, or Fortinet is doing in the cloud, or what Zscaler is doing in the cloud, or Versa Networks, that kind of stuff. You are that. So multi cloud, hybrid cloud, hybrid cloud, multi cloud. More security, more availability. That's where the industry trends are going. Guess what? That was the old trends anyway. Off of the proprietary nonsense into vendor level interoperability. So right now we're predominantly doing lift and shift for that reason, interoperability and speed, but at some point we'll get to more cloud native architectures and that is coming you know, a couple of years from now, maybe five, 10 years from now, but we're not there yet because of all the risk and challenges in the cloud that are still there. So that's really what you should understand. So the, as the industry is maturing, the networking becomes more critical because people have realized they went to the cloud, they didn't think about the network and they're not having outages. 16% of all cloud attacks actually happen from misconfigured S3 buckets on AWS. So people are starting to learn how to lock that down. And people are starting to realize, wait, the cloud's nothing more than we're going to data center. So I need people that know that. That's really where the industry is going. It's going from a virtualized network in a data center, which it is now, to something that at some point will likely be more transformational when we get to more cloud native things that can be expanded more easily across cloud. But right now, Multi-cloud, 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 multi-cloud. Customers are demanding it. And we're starting to get closer to the, something called the industrial cloud. Amazon's trying to do something in the, in the auto industry. We'll see how they do. Now, th let's talk Oracle's cloud. There's a company called Cerner, medical electronic health record company. I consulted the Cerner a while back. They had 1,300 medical professionals working for them. And it just 1,300 people like me to make sure the product design would serve medical professionals. These they were that smart. They had thousands of people there. Now Oracle bought them for like $40 billion or some ridiculous amount of money like that. Now the Oracle Cloud has one of the biggest healthcare technologies in the world under its umbrella. Think about that. Microsoft, cool analytics, cool business stuff, extreme ability to advise the customer on how to di digital transformation. Mix that with the Oracle medical application made by medical professionals like me. Now, Oracle and Microsoft could deliver the world's greatest healthcare technology architectures together. So that's what I see in evolution where people are starting to get much, much, much better about understanding the business, 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 and how to lose and leverage this technology. It was first, hey, the cloud's cool, we gotta go there. And now it's like, okay, well, maybe the cloud's not cheaper. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. 
but what does this cloud do better? Okay, this level of agility, unbelievable. Got to go cloud. I need extreme performance. The cloud doesn't perform as well in my data center. Don't bring it to the cloud. So that's the reason we're going to see so many more hybrid clouds too. It was all, let's go to the cloud. Then it's like, well, maybe this should be local. So we're going to see a lot more hybrid multi-clouds coming soon. At least that's the way I see it. Microsoft was actually doing a nice job of it by offering VMs that you can run virtual machines, you can run in your data center. But I see more of a Nutanix or an OpenStack cloud in the data center connecting to an Azure cloud and an AWS cloud, an Azure cloud and a Google cloud, an Azure cloud and a Google cloud. Two clouds plus a cloud, that's what I see. Because as we become more and more dependent upon tech, the tech has to work. And we can't be dependent upon any single point of failure. And a single cloud is a single point of failure, no matter how many availability zones and regions you do. Look at all those Azure outages, AWS outages this year. They weren't isolated to the data center that had the power failure. They were global. So can't take down a network, can't take down a control plane and expect everything to work. So what caused, what caused a cloud to go down? A hacking event, a serious networking event, or a control plane failure. So you got to plan around that. you got to expect the clouds to fail. And that's what we cloud pros need to be aware of. Up and up. Hi, Mike and team. Besides playing golf, what can I do to better entertain a customer as a female architect? Well, here's the thing. Golf is one of them. Dinners are one of them. Lunches are one of them. Plays and shows and Broadway shows could be something else. Football games could be something else. Literally anything. But I hate to say it. At least 25% of your time as an architect is literally speaking, entertaining clients. How much? Well, one year I spent over $100,000 on lunches of company money and more than $100,000 on dinner that year, just entertaining people. That was just part of the job. And at one point, I, when I was an engineer before I was an architect, I worked for a company and all of us would get pulled in the manager's office. You only spend $6,000 this month on your customers. You're not entertaining them. How are you building a relationship? So... Whether you're female or male is irrelevant in every single shape of the way. The key is, how do you entertain your clients? Well, here's what I would do. If I'm going to buy a gift for someone, there's two options. So let's say it's me. I love nice yoga stuff. Not yoga pants, but like really good yoga mats because I practice yoga each day. I like high-end computers because I always find a way to use them for something. And, you know, I like healthy food. So if you were to get a gift from me, you'd get me healthy food, a nice yoga mat, for example, or something that I like. So I would ask your customer, what are they interested in? Take them wherever they want to go, regardless of whether those places are, as long as it's not a place that you find patently offensive or admirably objectionable. So there's that. Ask them where they want to go. It was at one point, I remember, I got a text message from a friend of mine, and he says, hey, you're coming to the customer site today? I said, I am. And he said, maybe don't. I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, they said one of the leaders sent a text message that, or an instant message to a group of people that said, I'm hungry. Is Mike coming in for lunch today? And uh, they're like, I think they're taking you for granted. And I said, that's okay. I'll happily be the lunch buyer, the, the lunch person, as long as I've got relationships with anybody. So I bought lunches, 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 lunches. And all of a sudden, there was a, there was a bid, a request for proposal. We turned ours in and magically we won. So did we have a better product? Yeah, we did. But the relationship, relationship, relationship matters. So lots and lots of time, take them where they want to go. If it's a movie, a football game, a hockey game, a nice dinner, a play, who cares? Take them where they want to go. Make them happy. So when you buy a gift, you don't buy the gift that you would want. Buy the gift that they would want. Ask them where they want to go and just Google. And if for some reason you find it offensive, just don't go. For example... You know, there's certain places that I never went to in my career where much business is done because I didn't feel right about it. So just do that. Great question there, up and up. Love it. Mike, what skill set should we get to have a remote job? I need to know what job you want. Because the skill set for an architect is different than an engineer. So if you tell me the job, I can guide you. Otherwise, I could just give you skills. And those skills will most likely be incorrect and you'll never get hired. And I got to tell you, the biggest problem I've seen in cloud architect world is people want to become a cloud architect. They study DevOps, wrong thing to learn. 
SysOps, wrong thing to learn. Python coding, wrong thing to learn. For an architect, that's critical for an engineer. So if the architect has those skills, they're less hireable. If the engineer has those skills, thank God you got it. So that's the key. I need to know the job. There's no such thing as just cloud. I need to know the job. And realize there's no such thing as just the AWS cloud. I do need to know the job and what you want to do. And then you need to load that cloud, not any specific cloud. And specific clouds as well. So tell us the job and we can help you. Until then, it's the same airport filled with thousands of planes. Where do you want to go? If I told you to just jump on a plane at random, it might take you where you want. You might come to Palm Beach, Florida, and I could buy a lunch, and I would think that would be so much fun. But it might take you to Cape Town, which might also be fun. But, you know, if Cape Town's not your destination, guess what? It's no fun. What if uh, Brisbane is your destination and you ended up in uh, Newfoundland? That wouldn't be fun either. So tell me where you'd like to go, and then I can build you the map. Caro747, I understand that you have a good technical background. It would help you decide and learn the cloud. But what if you aren't highly technical? It would be a difficult transition. It's usually easier if you're not deeply technical. Well, it depends on the job. So here's something. You get a lot of cloud engineers that come to beauty that want to be cloud architects. And they want to focus on their coding skills. There are hands-on technical skills. And for example, as an architect, we don't touch the tech. Ever, 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 ever. So... When the engineers come and they want to focus on the tech skills, my biggest challenge with them, Cairo 747, is to teach them how to forget the engineering and how to learn the architecture skills. So I will tell you that it's usually easier for me to get a non-technical professional at a cloud architect job than it is a technology professional. And here's the reason. These architect jobs are 50 to 60% non-technical and only 40% technical. By comparison, if you wanted to be an engineer, which is a deep technical background, guess what? It would be better if you had a technology background because there would be less to learn. So the key is, and here's why these skills are so different. If you go out tonight and look at the sky, seriously, look at the sky. Look at the big bright sky. Look at the big dipper, the little dipper, the constellations, the stars, they're beautiful. Look at the moon. That's what an architect is. It's a big picture person that has to focus on the whole thing. As an architect, we design, present, and sell. But you need that big picture. Now tonight, after you look at the big, beautiful sky, take a telescope and zoom in maximum magnification on the moon. No, you won't even see the whole moon. You'll see a percentage of the moon. What can't you see is the sky. So for the architect, being too technical is a problem. For the engineer, not being technical enough is a problem. So the key is it's all dependent upon what job you want. And that's why I keep asking the job. And I will tell you this. Today you'll see Yvon Tamba that just got hired by AWS as a solution architect. Last week, you saw Raul from my channel who just got hired by as a, cloud, as a solution architect. And guess what? He had zero tech background too. Jordan Kitko yesterday made a post on LinkedIn. Chris, if you see the post, maybe you can pop it in the chat box so people can see it. I don't know. Here's the thing. He never had a tech job before. He came to us while he was in school. We taught him the cloud and he just got hired by AWS. Guess who else recently got one? I have another student who's 20 that just got hired by a major bank. No tech background whatsoever, but he worked his tail off. So the key is it's about are you willing to do the work to get what you want? And if the answer is yes, you can do anything you want. I used to practice internal medicine. Six months later, I was a senior network engineer at the world's largest internet service provider. I didn't start at the bottom. I didn't take a help desk job. I didn't do a, cloud, a network admin job. There was no reason to. I had the right skills. So, Caro 747, a doctor goes to medical school and they don't get a junior job when they're done. And guess what? When people go to medical school, they know nothing about anatomy, physiology, or the body. That's why they're going to school. So, what your background is, is irrelevant. What your goals and dreams are, is relevant. And what do you do to go conquer those goals and dreams? That's what matters. I have seen people that had terminal cancer survive because of the mental will to fight that wouldn't quit. I've seen patients in the hospital on their deathbed, and you know what? They waited until their son or daughter came from all over the world a week to see them. They died 20 minutes later. As soon as they said, thank you, hugged them and kissed them, and I love you, they died. But they waited there because it was in their mind. So do what you like. Do what you love. 
Win, win, win. And you'll get there. It's not your past. Your past doesn't define your future. So yesterday, for example, it was a long day. It was a great day. I taught my cloud architect class in the morning. It was a ball. I taught my cloud engineer class. And last night, me, my buddy Alonzo, and my good friend Sujit talked about blockchain. We loved it. It was so much fun. By the time I was done, it was 9 o'clock at night. I was tired, and I didn't feel like cooking, so what did I do? I ordered Uber Eats from Miller's Owl House, and I got two hamburgers, which were not lean beef, and three sides of broccoli. So I really blew my diet last night. I even had a whole grain of bread, and I don't ever eat bread. So I totally blew my diet. And you know what? I woke up this morning, and I said, it's a new day. So I had my oatmeal with my blueberries and walnuts. And guess what? I'll do my yoga today. I'll feel healthy again. And yesterday's bad diet was forgotten because it was the one time and I won't do it for a long time. So do what you love. Go after what you love and go get it. You can do anything you want. Go get it. Don't worry about anything being hard. Everything good is hard. Everything good is hard. Everything worth anything in life is hard. And if it's not hard, everybody would have it and it wouldn't be worth anything. It's that pesky supply and demand curve. When you're willing to do what others want, it's a motto. Today we do what others want, so tomorrow we do what others can't. It's a SEAL model, motto. For that reason, do what others won't today so you can have the future of your dreams tomorrow. That's what we did at the Cloud Architect Career Development Program. That's why I've gotten so many people at Cloud Architect jobs in the last year. I've gotten so many people hired over the year. Do what others won't. That's how you win. And you'll get there. So I hope I answered your question. Chris or child players bring in the next one. Good morning, Mike. When taking the Cloud Architect course with the live classes, what time are the classes held? They are held Tuesday at 9 a.m. Eastern time, which happens to be 2 p.m. UK time. They are Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern time, which turns out to be 9 p.m. UK time. And they are Friday at noon Eastern, which turns out to be 5 p.m. UK time. Note, I said UK time and not GMT because with daylight savings time, that lack thereof, it's always going back and forth. So they are when we run our classes. Now, here's the thing. We record all classes. So sometimes people have a full-time job. They pop into the class for 15 minutes. They ask a question or two and they watch the replay. And that's totally fine with us. So you attend as many classes as you can. And of course, in our program, it works as follows. We teach three live classes per week, which are a ball. In between live classes, we have hundreds of hours of training our students do. They do a project. They turn it in to get feedback from my team because we want to get better every day. And, of course, there's a set of lab modules, which, you know, there's about 30 AWS labs, which is no big deal. There's about 30 Azure labs. Again, no big deal. But there's our labs, the labs that get you hired, which is dealing with server virtualization and creating your own containers in our data center, dealing with setting up file servers in our data center the hard way, server message block, NFS, Dealing and building with firewalls and, and VPN concentrators. You'll be dealing with the Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP web stack because that's really common. You'll be setting up your own Active Directory servers. And every one of my students designs and builds their own cloud from scratch. That's right. You heard me. Every one of my students builds a cloud that distinguishes them from everybody else. See, other people are like, I learned to click three buttons. And we're like, I built a cloud. And all my students built the cloud. And, you know, why? Why are we so aggressive with this? Well, here's what employers want. They want the following. Someone that's technically competent. Which is more competent, someone that clicked three buttons or someone that's designed to build their own cloud from scratch that could build AWS, Azure, or Google from scratch. More competency. What employers also want? They want someone that's energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate. And who's energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate? I configured an S3 bucket like a little child, or I built a cloud. Okay. Now, employers want someone that's willing to go above and beyond. I turned on an EC2 and says, I built a cloud. So it's kind of like the lion versus the mouse. And you know, there's lots of other things we do, but that's why you're going to do real labs. Employers want to know that you know the network in the data center. Why? The cloud architect migrates the things from the network in the data center. So all the certification doesn't teach the network in the data center. So how do you migrate what you don't understand? The answer is you don't, you don't, you don't. So that's why we do it. We'd love to have you in class. 
and you take our class, you do all the work, you should be cloud hired in six to eight months. And we can't wait to make your video that says cloud hired. We didn't used to make videos in the beginning. To me, it was just normal. Everybody, somebody got hired. I was like, okay, great. Today, someone got hired. Tomorrow, somebody got hired. That's our job. And then my team said, hey, Mike, our students internally need to see all the cloud hires to be excited. And I said, you're right. So now we post the cloud hired videos for the rest of the world to see. Just let all of you know, you can get cloud hired. There's nothing holding you back other than you. You get the right training. You do the work. You can get any job you want. I think we've gotten about 100 people cloud architect jobs this year. And we only started this company a year ago. So that's pretty impressive. And now, now it's blossoming. It's like every day, this one's hired, this one's hired, this one's hired. But, you know, I've been coaching people for 20 years to get hired. I just did it private on one on one, like a more consultant. But when I saw the training that existed in the cloud space, I was horrified. And I said, all right, I'm going to create something real. Let's create the equivalent of one of those $50,000 master's degree program. And then let's take all the cost out of it and make it a price that anyone could afford anywhere in the world. And that's what we've done. And that's why we've gotten so many people caught hired. And we're super excited about it. We've been in about 20 different magazines so far. They've asked us to write articles about we're so successful getting people hired. And to me, it's the dream come true, getting people hired every day. That's why we do it. They're all about getting you hired. So let's get you caught hired. Ciao or whomever, please go have another one. James Foreman. What salary should a DevOps engineer with five years experience and 15 years software developer expect in the Northeast? Well, James, you're not giving me the rain information. So here's the thing. You could be the world's greatest engineer and still top out at $120,000. Or you can be a garbage engineer, have great soft skills, great emotional intelligence, exceptional leadership, exceptional CXO relevancy, and make triple that. So the key it determines is where do you want to work, what industry you want to work, and what skills are you willing to develop? I'm going to tell you this right now. Your soft skills are worth more than your hard skills. I hate to say it. It's pathetic. But your soft skills are worth more than your hard skills. So a DevOps engineer, it depends where you work. You know, I've got people that could get DevOps engineers at a big bank that have a $180,000 base salary and get a $300,000 bonus. But... What's special about them? They're really good. They've got good leadership skills, sales skills, emotional intelligence, communication skills. Likewise, I grew up dead. I know DevOps engineers that you have to hide in the closet that are also software engineers. And they're not getting above $110,000 in New York City because they're still stuck in the closet. They're all tech, 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 tech. And a big bank doesn't want to hire them and a big enterprise doesn't want to hire them. So, so James, what are you doing to improve it? That's going to be the determination of your salary. Are you the jack of all trades, which is going to lower your salary? Are you the person that's laser focused on being some kind of DevOps automation? That determines the answer. Are you an automation expert at automating something that may, like maybe there's some kind of banking transaction that they need automation on? If you're an expert on that, you're now more valuable. Do you have industry expertise? Which means, do you know the banking industry? Could you provide better banking solutions than someone else that's just technical? Again, that could double or triple your salary. So the question is not what salaries can you expect? Because the, the salary range is crazy. What do I mean by this? The CCIEs 20 some years ago were earning $110 an hour, which means when I became a CCIE, lots of these people were earning three and $400,000 on just contract work. Now, why were they able to do it? They were CCIEs, they were smart, and they spoke well, and the companies needed them, and they were just critical. My salary was always two to three times higher than my peers because I trained the soft skills, emotional intelligence, executive presence, et cetera, et cetera. So the choice is yours. You've got two sets of skills. You've got high-value skills. What can you do with the technology? How can the technology make business better? How can you recommend to a CEO to take this new DevOps solution? What will it do for the business? If it increases the speed of software automation by 32% and cuts defects by 12%, what does that equate to into dollars for the customer? You can quantify that. And you can show your DevOps thing 
is worth a billion dollars to the company, guess what? You're now a $500,000 DevOps engineer because you can build a business case around you. So the real key is what do you want to do? What do you want to learn? And what kind of DevOps engineer? Vertical industry expert? More money. Technical expert? Mm. Leadership expert of DevOps and how DevOps can translate to better business solutions? Lots of money. So that's the key. Which levers do you want to pull in your career? Do you want to hide and code and configure all day? I've got a friend that loves that. He's one of the most technical people I love. He loves it, loves it, loves it. And when I ask him, are you financially making enough money? He says, I wish I could earn more, but I don't want to be like you, Mike. And I said, okay. I said, you're happy? Yeah, I showed him how to do real estate investing. Guy made plenty of money. So that's the key. The key is do what you love. So you asked a question, I give you an honest answer. If you give me more clarification on which part of that you're interested in, there's that. But, you know, there's good. Now, I can also tell you in the Northeast, my favorite recruiter is ITXL, specifically Christina Marino. And you can see lots of information about them on our channel. They've gotten me three out of the five jobs I've ever taken in my life. They've helped many of my students get hired. And they are in New York City, ITXL. I think they're a fantastic recruiter and they're connected with everything good. And Chow, if you want to bring in the next one. Dasha Lee, oh, wonderful. You got the four networking books. Yeah. Basam Halabi's Internet Routing Architectures, Routing TCP IP Volumes 1 and 2 from Jeff Doyle, and the Stevens TCP IP is a good network foundation. That will give you the networking skills you need to be a great cloud architect or even a great cloud engineer. Good stuff. So happy. Alonzo Coleman. We will all have an awesome time in our live classes. Yes, Alonzo, we do. I've never had so much fun in my entire life since I did this. Been an architect now for a quarter of a century. God, that makes me feel old. Oh, my God, that makes me feel old. I was an architect before we even knew what architects were. <laughs> I mean, where we all had architect titles, and it was like, wait, it's still the same as an engineer. Nope. Now you're a business architect. Nope. Now you're an enterprise architect. Nope. Now you're a network architect. We played through all the roles, and we have so much fun, Alonzo. Great. Thank you so much, Alonzo. Alonzo was once my student, but he was so good we had to hire him, and now he's one of my C-level executives. Love having him here. EB. Hey, Mike, I'm a jack of all trades and a master of none. How do you break away from that? Real easy. So you got two options. So option one, continue to learn a little bit about everything. And guess what? You'll still be a jack of all trades. Option two, focus, focus, focus. So. Find the thing that you like the most. Maybe it's cloud networking. What is cloud networking? It's predominantly BGP. So go there, buy that book, Internet Routing Architectures, if you want to be there. Then get a couple of routers. Set up some BGP policies. For example, I'm just picking networking for an example. Change the weight, the local preference, the AS path, the origin code, the med. Play with it, play with it, play with it. Then... Play with a route summarization, route aggregation, then get used to internet tier gateway protocols such as OSPF. Learn how the areas work, learn how to segregate LSAs from areas. Then deal with IP addressing and subnetting and supernetting and route aggregation. Master VLANs, VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking. Get used to bonding Ethernet ports with things like Ether Channel, which is now called link aggregation groups by a lot of people. Get used to the hardcore, 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 and then you're good. So the key is just focus on one thing. So for example, I used to focus on medicine. That was there. Then I decided networking, so I joined networking. And when I joined networking, I realized that BGP, that's the least known skill. And it was the one that everybody needed and nobody knew it. So I said supply and demand curves. The greater the supply and the, greater the, and the lower the demand, the lower the price. So everybody else was being a jack of all trades. Let me learn a little Linux this, a little this, a little this, a little this. And I said, BGP, huge demand, zero supply. Looked at the supply and demand curve and said, big money here with BGP. So what did I do? I studied BGP. And not just a little. I studied it a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, and some more. A ton of it. BGP, BGP, BGP. I set up big BGP architectures. I tried every scenario. 
I read all the BGP RFCs. I got involved in every BGP project. The manager would say, we've got a BGP project and it's a disaster. And I'd say, please, please, I'm on it. And I did that. That's how I became a master. So what do I do? How have I been successful? I'm obsessive about what I need to do. So every day, I spent two to, two to three hours learning BGP for four or five years in addition to the work. That's how you break away from it. Focus all your time, effort, and money on the thing that you want most. Remove everything else. Look, when I did my CCIE 20 some years ago, IPsec was coming out. Wow, cool technology, but it was not on the CCI exams. You know what? Not something I learned until years later when I needed it. There was wireless starting to come around, but not part of the CCIE in those days. So guess what? I didn't learn wireless. So what I say and what I do for my students is I help them find the exact most critical skills for their job. I teach them to become experts at those, and I teach them to throw away or not learn at all anything that's unrelated to their job. That's how you become an expert. Focus, focus, focus. Like Bruce Lee said, I don't feel the man, fear the man that's practiced 10,000 kicks once. I fear the man that's practiced one kick 10,000 times because if he hits me with that kick, it's going to be lethal. Same thing. Bring it back to the basics the most critical things, and then you'll be great. That's what I recommend. Of course, you can change it. Bring in the next one. It was a really great question. I'm so glad you asked. Dash, I'm so happy you got those networking books. Of course, you can go to the next one. We already addressed it. Cloud hired Alonzo. 100% with you. up and up. We are honored to take your question, and that's why we're here. We want to help all of you get cloud hired. Whether you want that fresh cloud architect job, cloud engineer job, solution architect job, enterprise architect job, I don't care. I want to help you build your best cloud computing career. That's why we do this free cloud computing career training question and answer sessions every week, because I want you to know how to get your first cloud architect job, or your first cloud job, or your first cloud engineer job. I want you to know. So thanks for coming. Nagar Minaj, do we get a cloud job if you're an expertise in one service? I don't know what you mean by service. I will tell you what. If you just learn an AWS service, nobody's going to get hired for anything. You have to know the cloud. So tell me the career. If you want to be an architect, it's about knowing the network and the data center, for example, not a service. For example, here's what we need. We need BGP as an exterior gateway protocol. We need an interior gateway protocol knowledge, such as OSPF knowledge. We need IP addressing knowledge, subnetting, and supernetting knowledge meaning like route aggregation. We need knowledge of DNS, DHCP, or proxy arc. We need WAN technologies such as SSL VPNs, IPsec VPNs, private lines, Ethernet over MPLs private lines, software-defined networking and security, and SASE. Some networking things we need to know. We need to know switching, which includes VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking, Spanning tree, rapid spanning tree. We need to understand things like ether channel and link aggregation groups on the networking side. Now, as an architect, we also need to know servers and server virtualizations, containers and container orchestration, block storage, object storage, file storage, how load balancers work, and the types to architect them, and how to stack them, et cetera, et cetera. We need to know how security appliances work, such as next generation firewalls, because we don't use cloud native security, um, IDS IPS systems, VPN concentrators, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then we need to understand what enterprise applications do. How do you optimize the supply chain, ERP applications, CRM applications, et cetera. Then, because as an architect, for example, we need to design, present, and sell. An architect, for an example, needs to be an expert system designer. Because we don't touch the tech, the architect needs to be an expert presenting. The architect needs to be CXO relevant because you can't say to the CEO what you say to an engineer or you'll get kicked out of the room and you replace them. Well, thank you. You need to learn how to sell billion dollar plus solutions. So that means ROI modeling, for example, and business acumen. Now, you, as an architect, it's normal for us to present at conferences with thousands of people. So now we're talking about a very unique special set of presentation skills. We're also going to need to write for executives versus tech people and, we, and tech people who need to know that. So that's the kind of expertise that goes into a career. This is not a learn one service on a certification exam and get any job. These are professional careers. They have a body of knowledge that's required. So. I'm saying an expertise in an area, not a service. An expertise in networking. An expertise in security. Expertise in big data. 
that's enough for someone to build a 30 to a 50 year career, not a service. A service is nothing. A service is the, the name that a service provider made up for one thing. And in and of itself, they can't even use those services half of the time because they don't work multi-cloud. I hope I clarified that question for you. Please feel free to ask a follow-up to it. Alonzo, I try to be fun to hang out with. So most people consider me to be an extremist in my life. And I tend along very well with my other extremists because we have lots of fun. So, go to the beach all day and practice yoga for eight hours straight. Eddie Patrick. Eddie's over there in Cameroon. We love Eddie. Yes, please remember to jock a like and share this video to help as many others. Please like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, tell others. We want to do as much as we can to help the cloud computing community. While we're at it tomorrow, in order to help you get your first cloud architect job, we're going to hold our first How to Get Your First Cloud Job webinar. You can come on this webinar, and in this webinar, we'll do as many things as we can to help you get hired. We'll teach you what hiring managers are looking for, how to leverage your life experience to get hired. We'll tell you uh, the things that hiring managers are looking for, the things that need to be on your resume, how to train and get the right skills to get hired, how to skip pesky HR, get your, get your resume directly in the hands of the hiring manager so you can get hired and not auto-rejected when you don't have experience. So please join us tomorrow on the free How to Get Your First Cloud Architect Job webinar. Chris, you go to the next one. That's great to hear because you're in cybersecurity, but not highly technical. You as hesitant, almost like folks make it seem like you have to be te highly technical. It depends on the job you want. If you want to be a cloud security engineer, that is a very highly technical role. Extremely. Now, if you're talking about an enterprise architect focusing on security, no, that's not a highly technical role. Or a cloud architect focusing on security is 50-50. 50% architecture, 50% business, 50% tech. So it's all based upon the career you want. That's why I keep saying we need to know your career. Because a cloud security engineer is a deeply, deeply, deeply technical role. But an architect is more a digital transformation specialist than a salesperson. Almost like a sales guy with a lab coat on. So. It depends on the job, and that's why I keep saying I need to know the job. But cybersecurity on the cloud, cybersecurity off the cloud, it's the same job. It's just where you're putting your cybersecurity things. It's the same stuff. We're not using the cloud security stuff. It's not strong enough. We're using the same Palo Alto firewall, Cisco firewalls, next generation firewall. It's all the same. Dasha Lee. Our group, Mike said, we need to focus on one thing to be an expert. Your only question is, which one is the most money-making skill? Tasha Lee, I got to tell you, it's you that's your most money-making skill. It's not your tech skills at all. It's how can you transform a customer. So Dasha Lee, I want you to think about it. Two architects show up at the CEO's office. Architect one, hi, CEO. I understand you need a new website. I can help you. My team can make websites that are higher converting and higher performance. We're going to use AWS, network elastic load balancers, and then EC2 instances. And then after that, we're going to use an AWS network load balancer and some more EC2 instances. And after that, we're going to use Amazon Aurora. CEO is going to say, okay, um, bye. Or you could say to the, because that's not what they care about. Or you can ask the CEO, could you, could you tell me about your business? Could you tell me how much of your money comes in via the web? Could you tell me the challenges your customers are complaining about on the web? Are they complaining that it it's too slow and not responsive? Are you not getting the search performance that you need because the latency on your website is too high? What business challenges do you have? And what kind of things would you like me to do to help make your business grow? And then they say, well, Mike, we've got this website. It's here, but this is causing this, this, and this. And I can say to them, hmm. So what you're telling me is your customer base is about 18 million users. You think that you're losing about 3% conversion due to this, this, and this. Let's take 3% related to your amount of web traffic, traffic per year. Wait, Mr. Customer, that equals $1.8 billion of lost revenue. Here's a solution I can design for you that, co that costs only $100 million. Are you interested? Yeah, Mike, sign me up, sign me up, because I've just made money for them. So the key is, that's your most valuable skill. It's not 
How do you build the tech? That's a moderate skill. What can the tech do to transform lives? That's your highest value skill. And it's not, it's not your tech skills at all. It's, uh, that's why we teach so much business acumen. Why? Why did one of my students get a $300,000 a year job as a graduate recently? Because he focused on the transformation. Steve Jobs said it best. He said, I don't even talk about the tech. I talk about what the technology can do for you. That's what we architects do. That's why we're paid so much. We don't talk about the tech. We talk about what the tech can do for transformation, and we leave the tech to the technology professionals. So the key is whatever you do, be an expert on one thing. What pays most is always your communication skills, your leadership, your executive presence, your business acumen. That's always going to pay the most. But what do you have to do, Dasha? What makes you happiest? That's what pays the most. You know why? I have, Let's assume somebody decided to make me a software engineer. I hate coding, and I will never do it. But if I had a job as a software engineer, this is what it'd be looking like on my computer. I'm miserable, I'm miserable, I'm miserable, I'm miserable, I'm miserable, I'm miserable. Now, then someone comes to my desk, get out of here. I don't like this. Now, my manager comes, you, you want to do this project? No, Mike. Okay. Is that manager going to pay me? No. Am I going to be in that company until the next layoff has to occur and am I getting out of the answer? Is yes. Now, if I love coding and I'm here typing on my keyboard, and somebody junior comes into my office and I say, oh, let me teach you this. It's something I learned is a valuable skill. And then I notice the team's weak. And I go to my manager and I say, I know the team's weak on this. Would you be fine if I decided to teach the that teach some training to the whole team? And the manager say, please, please, please. And then you take the team and you lead the team and you teach them new skills. You make them more productive. Now you're paid triple. But why? You had to love it in the first place. So that's the key. We can make money at anything. That's not challenging with the right skills. Right? you got to love what you do. As Mark Twain said, make your vacation, your vocation, meaning your job, and you'll never work a day in your life. I left healthcare 25 years ago, and I've never worked a day in my life. Sure, I put in 10 hour, 12 hour days, but I've never worked because I've loved it. That's what I like to say. So make your vacation your vocation, and never you'll never work a day in your life. Um, the Cloud Architect programs includes tremendous soft skills and emotional intelligence training, leadership training, executive presence training, business acumen training like RL modeling. We have to because it's not possible to get a real good architect job without it. So, yes, we do. Extensively, extensively presentation skills, scale skills, RL modeling, business acumen, negotiation skills, interview skills, leadership skills, CXO relevancy skills. And I'm missing half of the soft skills, the emotional intelligence, empathy, everything we cover in there. That's why this would be an extremely expensive course, because those are the skills. And yes, we teach them in depth and extensively. Not only that, we'll make you deliver presentations and we'll give you feedback on them. We'll make you do executive writing and give you feedback on them. We'll make you do empathy workshops and you get feedback on them. So you're going to get better every day. Ours is about mastering all the critical skills to make our architects the greatest architects in the world. That's why our people get hired every day. And yes, we have extensive training in soft skills. My, the link is up, so I'll mention it again. If anybody's interested in getting their first cloud architect job or first cloud engineer job or getting hired, we have 30% training discount right now for the Memorial Day holiday. Coupon code is Memorial. Let us help you get cloud hired. I'm new to the cloud thing. What's your advice with regards to choosing a cloud solutions to master AWS or Azure? I'm going to tell you a master neither. I need you to learn the cloud. Okay, so you want to be a cloud administrator. Then if you only want to be a cloud administrator, I'd advise you to learn either AWS or Azure. It doesn't matter. Master configuration, the name of the service and how to configure that service, and you will be a cloud admin. Now, I'm going to tell you this. The chances of getting a cloud admin job are so hard versus a cloud engineer job. And in most cases, it is so much harder to get an entry level job than it is to get a better, more senior job. So I want you to understand this. And here's why. There used to be a ton of admin jobs. And here's, and here's what they were. The data center guy, with somebody would, or girl, they'd come in, they'd rack something, they'd use a drill, screw it in, zip, 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 zip. They'd cable up the server, then they'd install the, the VMware hypervisor, then they'd install the create the virtual machines and install the operating system. We don't do that anymore. 
So understand that getting an admin job is going to be the hardest thing in the world. That it would be easier for you to get a cloud architect or a cloud engineer job with the right training. So keep that in the back of your mind. You don't need to do a cloud admin job. It'll be easier with the right training to get a higher paying job because there's not a lot of world work for junior level positions right now. So the first thing I would tell you is that. Now, if you're insistent upon doing cloud admin, I would get an intro certification and we consider the AWS Certified Solution Architect Profession will be intro. That's what I would do. I'd apply for some jobs and you know, try it for a little while and see the results. And for an admin job, you'll probably get it with just certification, but it might take you a year because admin jobs are few and far in between. Now, by comparison, if you actually wanted a bigger role in the cloud, like a cloud engineer or a cloud architect, I would advise you not to learn a single cloud, but to learn the cloud. Because it's like driving a car. If you know how to drive a car, it doesn't matter if it's a Chevy, a Ford, a BMW, a Honda, oh, got to turn, change directions, honk, honk. It doesn't matter. So I tell you to learn the cloud, the cloud, the cloud, and not a cloud provider. So learn what a virtual machine is. And if it's VMware ESXi, KVM, QEMU, Citrix, the Dell cloud, the Cisco cloud, the Palo Alto cloud, the Verizon cloud, American Airlines cloud, AWS's cloud, Azure cloud, Google's cloud, it's the same thing. Now learn what a load balancer is. Guess what? It's the same from F5 in the data center. It's the same cloud load balancer in Google, Elastic load balancer on AWS, Azure load balancer. It doesn't matter, it's the same technology. So I generally advise people not to do admin roles for the following reasons. They're gonna be hard to get because there's not a lot of need for them. There's the need for more sophisticated people as a rule, but you could try getting them. And if you can't get one, and I'm telling you what to do to get one, try for a better role because you'll be there. So the next question becomes is, from there, where do you want your plan to be? Do you wanna be a deep technology professional or a business professional versus your engineer versus your architects? And if you wanna be an engineer, not only do you need to learn the cloud stuff, the network and the data center stuff, you need to know Linux, Python, Terraform, and networking, and you'll be good. If you wanted to be on the architect side, it's learning much more sales skills and leadership skills, emotional intelligence, network and data center design skills. Those are the things that you would be doing. So when we talk about these things, these are the kind of things that we're talking about. But to be a cloud admin, just admin, I pick up one of the certifications at the professional level, like an AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional or an Azure Solution Architect Expert. I think you generally need to take the associate for the, or there's a basic one you need to take prior to that exam with Azure. With AWS, you could just take this. Learn it, learn it, learn it, learn this. Serve the name of a service and how to configure it because that's what admins do. But please keep in mind, junior level jobs are really hard to get. And as we're getting into a recession, what it looks like, we've got producer, producer prices going up. We've got extreme inflation pressures, both in consumer goods, as well as employee costs and producer costs. We've already had a negative quarter of GDP growth. And it looks like, you know, if we're in bear market territory in the stock market. It looks like we're getting closer to a recession. And in a recession, nobody wants the junior level people because they need the most supervision, the most management. And for every admin, you need some expensive engineers to help supervise them. So it may be easier and better for you to prepare yourself to be a cloud engineer or a cloud architect and get a better job. I think you'll have an easier time getting it. So keep that in the back of your mind. Especially if we approach an economic downturn, you want to stand out. So keep that in your mind. Try it. That's how you would get a, a cloud admin job. But if you don't get it based on certification alone, and most jobs aren't, but the, the only reason I say certification is the whole ad job of an admin is the name of the service and how to configure it. So that's, that's probably almost enough for a cloud admin job. But if you don't get one and realize the admin jobs are so much harder to get than the more senior jobs, then increase your training and you'll be good to go. And I can talk to you if you like that and help you out with that. We've gotten a whole bunch of people that have never worked in tech hired. You can look at our cloud hired videos. Anybody who wants to do it can get it as their first job. They just have to train right. Well, I'll suggest I'm not sure I completely understand. You're aiming to be a solution architect at AWS. AWS hires our students and graduates every single day as solution architects. 
I don't want to be an NW architect. I have no idea what NW architect is. But yes, we've gotten lots of people hired by AWS. Today's video that we released is his name is Romanek Ivan Tamba. He just got hired by AWS as a cloud architect. He had no experience before taking our course in this company. And we get students hired by AWS as a cloud architect, solution architect every day of the week. And we could help you too. But I don't know what NW architect is. Of it, how to job, get a job as a fresher in the cloud, same way as everybody gets a job in the cloud, but you didn't tell me which job you want. So tell me cloud architect versus the cloud engineer, and I can give you the path. I'll tell you what, I've gotten two freshers this week hired as solution architects, one by one of the biggest banks in the world and one by AWS. They were both freshers. Actually, one doesn't even have a college degree, and one does. But he just graduated college two weeks ago, his name is Jordan Kitko. You can see his uh, LinkedIn post. Um, maybe one of my team can show you his LinkedIn post. Just graduated college like a week ago. He's hired by AWS and has done our training. That's how he did it as a fresher. We trained him. But if you actually tell me the job and you don't want to train with us, I'm happy to tell you what you need to do for that too. But I still need to know the job. You want to be an airplane pilot? Do you want to be a doctor? Do you want to be a lawyer? All different careers. And just a job isn't really enough. I need to know the job path is like an airport. Which plane do you get on? Do you go to the one that goes to Delhi? Do you go to the one that goes to Punjab? Do you go to the one that lands to London? Do you go to the one that goes to Istanbul, Turkey? Do you go to the one that goes to Athens, Greece, Cape Town, South Africa, and Lagos, Nigeria, New York? I don't know. Tell me where to go, what kind of job, and I can help you. But it's not just about a job. It's about being precise on the job. Because every job has different skills and requirements. But it's a great question. Sadiq, okay, this is a great question. Could you tell me, if you want to be a cloud engineer as a fresh graduate student, what is the what is the must skills you need to have to clear the interview? Well, Sadiq, I'm going to tell you right now. To clear the interview, you have to be what the hiring manager wants. What does the hiring manager want? The hiring manager wants someone that is technically competent. It doesn't mean experience, it means competent. Next thing they want to know is somebody they can trust. Why? Because most people lie to them on the interview, and you can't hire anybody that lies to you. Next, employers want someone that knows what they know and knows what they don't know, so they don't make big mistakes. Kind of like the person that took Facebook down for eight hours with a BGP misconfiguration error. They don't want that. Next, employers want energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate person. Who do you want? Don't bother me. I'm annoyed. Or how can I help? Next, employers want a team player. And here's the reason why. You're never going to be on your own in this career. Everything is done in teams. Last thing they want to know is that you're willing to go above and beyond. So if you can't convey that on the interview, you're not getting hired, period, at any company anywhere in the world. So that's the first thing that you need to promote. Now, the next thing we need to know is you, you have the competency. What is that competency? That competency is network and data center technology, such as BGP, IP addressing, subnetting, supernetting, route summarization. It is knowledge of interior gateway protocols and what they do. It is not a DNS, DHCP, R, proxy, R, and you need to understand these. For example, a DNS request can't go off the subnet because it's a broadcast, so you need like a helper address, and you need to understand how to architect around that. You need to understand DNS to say, hey, wait, in this three cloud solution, we can't use Route 53 because it's a single point of failure. We might need to use an FI system across four different clouds. There's that. Now, we're going to be dealing with wide area network technology which means you must know about IPsec tunnels, SSL tunnels, uh, private lines, Ethernet over PLS, uh, software-defined networking, uh, software, uh, SASE, which is a, a new flavor of software-defined networking with integrated security. Then you'll be dealing with switching concepts, so VLANs, VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking, etc. You'll be bought, which men mean spanning tree, rapid spanning tree, so you don't get loops. That then is going to turn itself into the following. Then we need to make sure that you understand servers and server virtualization because we're going to be dealing with it all day long. Containers and container orchestration, block storage, object storage, file storage. Knowledge of security, and that's not the cloud security tools. I mean firewalls, next generation firewalls, IDS, IPS systems, VPN concentrator. You need to understand the business applications such as CRM applications and ERP applications. 
Then you need to understand Linux, and I mean Linux in depth, like a Linux admin. You need to have moderate understanding of Python, moderate understanding of Terraform. And if you know a little bit about CICD pipelines, that would be pretty helpful as well. Those are the skills to become a cloud architect. No, none of this is taught in certification. This is a professional job. You can do that. They're, that's what you'll get as a cloud engineer. Those are your cloud engineer skills. And with them, you'll get hired on every interview. Master that, nothing else, and you are going to be an exceptionally, exceptionally good place. Dasha Lee. Mike, you just gave me the most valuable career advice of your life. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. That's why I do this. I'm really trying to show people how do you find the biggest high-value targets to put your time, effort, and money so you can have the longest-term career success. My goal is to shave 10 years off of everybody's career here to help you do well. Actually, if you're all here, give me a hashtag cloud hired. And if you've got some questions, um, let me know. I think I see a few questions in the chat box, but not too many. So if you've got some questions, I've got a few more minutes. But I only have about 15 to 20 minutes, so please ask some questions. I want to help you as many people as I can in the free time that I have available today. Jbari23, have I ever had a customer that you could not get through and failed to close? Absolutely. What did I learn from this? Oh, this is the best lesson. So early in my career, I worked from one, I would say, one of the best technology companies in the world. This company was a spinoff of another tech company, and this company had the best engineers I've ever seen. We must have had 100 IIT graduates that were like super geniuses. And where this company found these engineers and architects, I don't know, but they were some of the freakishly smart engineers and architects I've seen in my life. We would constantly get pulled into compete against Cisco. We would do bake-offs, and we would win on the technical merits every single time. And you know what would happen? We lose every deal. And here's what I learned. Those engineers would come in, and they'd tune the box. They'd play with the power. They'd somebody would be tuning the FPGAs and they could maximize the performance out of this. I've never seen engineers like this in my life. But they lost every deal and here's why. They went to the customer, our switch is the fastest switch in the world. It's wire speed, it does this, 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 and this. Because I'm say, prove it, and we did. Our competition, Cisco would go in and they'd say, our switch is 5% slower. But our switch combined to this application, this application, this application, and this application can transform your business by using all these things, even if it's 2% slower. We can increase your revenue by 10%, cut your operational expenses by 30%. Are you interested? Now you're a customer. You got the genius techies who switch is 5% better, or you got a company that can save $2 billion of expenses per year. Whose stuff do you buy? It's never the tech. So but I learned that it's never, ever, ever about the tech. And I was a hardcore engineer, and that was really hard for me to learn. It's not about the tech. It's about the transformation. So since then, I've not talked about the tech, just like Steve Jobs doesn't talk about the tech. I talked about what the tech could do for the company, how the tech would improve the company, how the tech could change lives, how the tech could change the customer experience, how the tech can enable the company to work with 10% less people, which would help the company in the financial crisis, or how to take the 10% less people that we no longer need and then redeploy them in the business for greater business growth. So that was the biggest thing that I've learned. Even with that, you're not going to win every deal. For example, the Azure won a deal for the U.S. government's transformation, and AWS sued. And Azure lost after a lawsuit. So Azure had the best solution. Customer, government wanted it, but through a lawsuit, it went to AWS. So that's an example. You can do everything right, win a deal, and still lose it. But usually what goes wrong, usually when deals are lost, is because people focus on the tech and not the transformation. That's usually the biggest problem. 
Salespeople should be focusing on transformation, not the tech. You can architect speeds and feeds. Our firewall is faster than yours. Get out of here. Our firewall can improve your security posture by the following way. If something that comes in doesn't look right, our firewalls can look at it and say, hmm, pattern matching techniques, I don't like it. Therefore, they can reset the TCP connection, add an access list on demand, or just create an, or block something and heal it on the fly. Which is more interesting to you? Fastest, 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 or look what it can do. So don't focus on the tech, focus on the transformation, and your career will be two to three times better than your competition. You'll win more deals, you'll earn more, and you'll rise to the top. Extremely good question. What is the best sales book you could recommend? Ooh, I can't tell you the great many sales books. I've read all of them. There was a little red book of selling that people liked. There was a book called Selling the Veto. Dale Carnegie's work was always good. Here's how you sell. Solve your customer's problems. That's how you sell. All these sleazy sales tactics, like I get 50 emails a day from someone that wants to sell me. First, sending unsolicited email is spam and illegal. So then people, 50 to 100 people each day, spam me to say, I can fix this thing in your business. And I say, I don't have a problem with that thing in my business. You tried to solve a problem that wasn't there. So best sales, that's fine. Don't be a sales rep. Whoa, best sales, don't be a sales rep. It's a dash of league. If you came to me and you said to me, I want to go to the cloud. And I say, what business problem are you trying to solve? And you said, I am a healthcare organization and I know that if I put my systems on the cloud, and the, uh, they have to work because my patients, if the system records can't be seen, some will die. And then I'd say, okay, Dasha, okay, let me make sure I understand the problem. Your technology systems are so critical that if they go down, someone will die. And you say, yes. And I'm going to say, okay, let's talk about what we need to do. Well, I'm a cloud, I love the cloud and I'd love to take you to the cloud. Putting you on one cloud is too dangerous. What if your wide area network goes down to the cloud or the cloud goes down? Therefore, Mr. Customer, we've got two options. I could put you on two different clouds, two availability zones per cloud. I could create two private lines to each cloud and, we, and that would be fine. Or I could really take advantage of the resources you have in your data center, turn that to an open stack of Nutanix cloud, and then connect you to another cloud and either with a couple of availability zones and then you should be good to go. And the customer would say, thank you. And the customer would say, Mike, this thing that you're describing is going to cost $30 million a year. And I'd say, okay, now let's evaluate this. How many patients do you have per hospital? What is the cost of downtime to you? Meaning the cost of your staff. What happens if you're downtime? What are the losses? What happens to your joint connection accreditation? What happens to this? And they say, okay, Mike. Yeah, wow. And I say, I say, let's quantify that problem. And they say, that problem's roughly $60 million a year. And I say, okay, you've got a $60 million problem and a $30 million solution. Let's talk about how do we solve your thing. They're interested. Fast a league. I charge less than $1,000 for my course. I get people $100,000 plus jobs every day of the week. It's a no-brainer to buy my course. No-brainer. Because for nothing, I'm delivering extreme results. That's why customers flock to us. That's the reason. Because the way you sell things is you solve your customer's problem. And you solve your customer's problem at a cost that is so much less than the value they receive it, so they can't help but buy it. I got two computers for you. Computer A, $100,000. But if you have this magical computer, it's going to do some cool crypto mining thing that's going to pay you a million dollars a year. I got another computer that's a thousand dollars and it's going to break every day. Which one do you buy? Personally, a business would go finance that hundred thousand dollar computer and make money. That's how you sell. So a lot of sales books teach you all these sleazy sales techniques. How do you sell? Honesty, integrity, ethics. Know your customer. Get to know your customer. Develop a relationship with the customer. When you've got a product to, to sell and it's not the right one for the customer and the customer says, should I buy it? Say no. And then when the customer needs something, say, I can solve your problem. They're going to say, 
oh, Dasha, I want to work with you. I totally trust you. You've told me no in the past. <laughs> I want your solution. So build the name, build the career. That's how I sell. It's not based on sales books. Solve a customer problem. Make sure your solution costs less than the value. Done. You're sold. Chris, you can bring in the next one. You're so welcome, Sadiq. Build the career of your dreams. So, just I recommend this course for anybody that wants to be a cloud architect. Whether you're a nurse, I'll find a way to get you cloud hired. Whether you're a software engineer, I'll get you a cloud architect job. It doesn't matter your background. That's why I created this. Nobody has experience on this. The only people that ever had experience in the cloud are, are CCIEs. So we've been working with clouds now for 30 years. No one knows the cloud, especially software people. They know the least about the cloud because they're writing code. Guess what? Software architecture, halfway there, because you know architecture is less than is different than engineering. And of course, we could get you a cloud architect job. We got a few uh, applications in software architect job, big jobs, huge jobs, actually. And we'd love to get you hired. Easily, easily, easily would get you hired. But again, I'm getting people that have never worked in tech, big cloud architect jobs. People that work in tech like you, it's a bonus. Typically, people that work in tech, we're dealing with about uh, four to six months versus six to eight months for people that have not worked in tech. Yeah, we'd love to work with you. We could easily get you hired as long as you focus on the architect skills and didn't try to stay married to the deep engineering skills, then we could easily get you hired as a cloud architect, easily. We teach you what you need to know. Likewise, I didn't know how to practice medicine when I was born. I learned. The people that got hired this week, they didn't know anything about architecture before we got them. We trained them. So yeah, we train you and we could easily, easily get you a cloud architect job, assuming you did all the work and followed our instructions. Grace, you can go to the next one. Hello, Mike. How is your cloud architect course with live sessions and without live session districts? Well, and when you get to attend live classes and another one you don't. So that's the only difference. So when we teach the course with the live classes, we record the live classes and we put them in the non-live class version. So what's the difference? If you're in the live class, we get to know you. So if I get to know you and one of my recruiter buddies reaches out to me and says, hey, do you know anybody? I can say, I know this guy in Dinesh. He's participating in class and he's awesome. But guess what? You won't need that because we follow the LinkedIn advice. We get our average student gets 10 to 15 interview requests per day anyway. But if you want to ask a question live, you can do that in the live class. You don't come to the live class. You have to ask your question through Slack. In either case, you're going to get an answer. The content's identical. Every single thing is the same in both. But when you get to be in a live class. So in a live class, I'll do an architecture and you can participate. I'll call on you. You'll be interacting with the other people in the class. Live. Via voice. If you're not in a live class, guess what? You'll watch the identical live classes. You just won't be able to ask questions in class. You'll have to use Slack. So... There's that. Otherwise, either case, we're going to get you hired. The live is better. But for people that can't do the live classes or can't afford the live classes, that's exactly why we created this version. To make sure that we could help anybody that wanted to get cloud hired, get cloud hired regardless of their time zones or financial background. That's why we created it. And we'd love to get you cloud hired too. That's the only difference. Attending live classes, watching, watching recording of the live classes. Everything else is identical. Jay Don, if you want to end up in Microsoft, is this Cisco a waste of time? Jay Don is, again, the wrong question. What is your goal job at Microsoft? What is the career you're trying to build? If you want to be a cloud network architect at Microsoft, yeah, a, a CCI or a CCNP is hugely beneficial. If you want to be a cloud security architect, it's not beneficial at all for anybody in any career anywhere. So it's all about what career do you want? And what is the illusion of competency you're trying to build on your resume? 
All certifications are just one purpose. Help, help you get an interview. But let's look at this. I've got an Azure Solution Architect expert that's a CCIE that's applying for a cloud networking job. Hmm. Network expert that also knows the cloud. Yeah, I need to hire them for Microsoft. Hmm. But if you want to be a cloud big data architect and you've got a CCIE, it's like, yeah, no. I don't want a network guy. I want a big data guy. So the question is, what is it you want to do? That drives your certifications. Just doing certifications is a complete and total waste of your time, effort, and money. And just doing certifications, if they're the wrong certifications that don't match your career, they make you look unfocused and harder to hire. So what job do you want? That will determine what we need to put on your resume and what your certifications on your resume should be look like to help you get that interview. What gets you hired? Knowledge, competency, attitude, energy, enthusiasm, communication skills, sales skills, emotional intelligence. That's what gets you hired. Tell us what you'd like to get to and we can help you. But otherwise, without that, it's all conjecture. It's like me prescribing medication. Is uh, gentamicin a bad antibiotic? It's bad. It can take out the ears and the kidneys. Is it a bad antibiotic? Well, if I'm using it for a sore throat, yeah, that's terrible. But if I need to use that drug for a reason to save a life, it's not a waste of time. So it's all application. It's all use case for everything in tech. What's the problem probably you're trying to solve? What career do you want? What do you want, what do you want to, when you build your brand? I, that, that's what it's all about. Tell us the career I can help you. Chris, you can go to the next one. B. Sim, uh, B. Singh, Mr. Lion. It all depends on how you plan for it. I took the Google Professional Cloud Architect exam, which is the hardest exam with two days preparation. I passed it. It was nothing. For the people that go to the uh, guaranteed test exam sites, someone can pass the AWS Solution Architect exam in less than two days. Now, here's the thing. Nobody's getting hired for passing the exam. But based upon how you do the exam, it could take you anywhere from two days to two months. Very simple exam. Super, super simple. It's kind of like an intro to junior level intro about the cloud, but it won't lead to a job, but it will help you get an interview. So super easy exam. I've seen people do it in less than two days. I've seen people do all 10 certifications in two months by going to the wrong websites where they bought copies of the exam. So that's why these exams don't lean that much, but they help you get an interview. So we still do it. So how much time does it take you to clear the AWS exam? I don't know. You could do my training which is completely free. And then you could also do Andrew Brown's training from Exam Pro, which is also completely free. You could also read our book, which is completely free, get a practice test and probably do it in a week, two weeks at most if you wanted to. But it's all how you study. It's all how fast you learn. I mean, I might do it in two days, but it might take you three months. We all learn at different speeds. I can lock myself in our room and read a thousand pages a day. I have lots of training from my healthcare background. You may not like to read. It might be slower for you. So all in good time. But it's a very easy exam, and one should do it, along with the AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional. And that's our view of an entry level of certification, that you mix that with all those other things that we talk about, and you can get a great job. But it's not based on the certification. Certification is just a test. The jobs are based upon competency, attitude, energy, enthusiasm, and the ability to do the job, which is not covered in certification. But you can do the certification in two days to two months on average. Chris, you can go to the next one. Can you get a cloud engineering job if you've been studying AWS? No, you can get a cloud engineering job if you've been studying cloud, 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 which means network and data center technologies. That includes the following. BGP, OSPF, spanning tree, rapid spanning tree, VLANs, VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking. It includes DNS, DHCP, ARP proxy ARP, IP addressing, subnetting, and supernetting, WAN technologies such as IPsec tunneling, SSL tunneling, private lines, Ethernet over MPLS, software-defined networking, and SASE. VLANs, VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking, spanning tree, and involved block storage, object storage, file storage, server virtualization, container orchestration, 
It involves de- it involves um, load balancers and how to use them and how to set them up. And block storage, object storage, and file storage, how they have it set up. Then it involves knowing industry applications. Then for the cloud engineer, it involves learning Linux and being an expert on Linux, knowing Python, learning a little bit of Terraform. That's what it takes to get a job at any cloud provider. And if you're AWS certified and you know those things, you'll get hired by Google, Azure. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares about the certification. They care about the competency. So if you truly know the cloud, then you can work anywhere. Now, if you just know AWS, you can't work anywhere, including AWS, because those are the skills needed to be a cloud engineer, and they're, they're not just AWS. Because remember, you're building the systems the way architects design. Those systems are typically Linux, almost always. So keep that in the back of your mind. But yes, if you've been studying the cloud and know the cloud, you can get a job anywhere. But that's why we say train the cloud, not a cloud provider. I don't learn how to drive a Honda and then expect to get into Mercedes and know, know, know how to do it. I learn to drive a car. And then by learning the dri- car driving principles, I can drive anything. So that's our recommendation. Don't learn AWS. Don't learn Azure. Learn the cloud. Then you can work anywhere. Chris, I may be able to take one or two more. Not sure. I'll try to get one more tomorrow. Clement, when does the training start? The second you sign up, you get brought into training. And then you get rolled into our next class. So the people that have signed up this morning will be in class. Our next class is Thursday at 4 p.m. So we don't do batches. There's no reason to it. You know, I come from a medical background and a martial arts background. And the worst thing you can do is put all your newbies together in a 12-week program. Horrible, horrible idea. And here's why. In that 12-week program, you got everybody that's a newbie that doesn't know anything. So now you got a bunch of people. It's kind of like the poster of the blind leading the blind. And what do I mean by that? That actually means that you we do it intentionally different. Uh, sorry, my team is texting me, telling me that I, I need to get off, but I'm going to finish this call anyway. So what are we talking about? So what we're talking about is this. I mix them all together. So people attend my class today. Now, in my class, I've got some cloud architects that are re- and cloud engineers either based in the class that are ready to graduate and get hired. So they lead the class. I've also got some people in the program that have been in my program for a month, and they help the senior people. And I've got some new people that signed up today in class. So now I design an architecture, and we cycle through the architecture so that everybody does every architecture. But it's architecture. So let's say we decided to do a hospital last week. Guess what? We found our hospital. Poof, we've done our architecture. The senior students lead it, the mid people help, and the junior people watch. A month later, senior students are hired. They're all cloud hired. They're all thanking me. They all got six figure plus jobs. They're thrilled. Now, those junior and pitted people move up to the senior people. Those people that are, were the junior, now the medium people. They help the senior people. And guess what? The new set of senior people get hired, and the other people wrote them. So, you know why we do it this way? Because we keep you in the program until you're hired. That's right. This is not a batch. This is not take our training. We don't give a darn about you. You've got a $30,000 loan or income sharing agreement. We didn't do that. This is a course that we took that was $50,000, made it like less than $1,000. So it'll be a single day's pay for the average architect. And you can stay in our program for up to a year. I had a student that bought our course and never showed up. Nine months later, they said, with all the cloud hires, I want to take your class. I said, welcome back. By doing it this way and not running batches, I can let anybody stay in the program for a year or until they get hired, and nobody needs a year. That's why we do it this way. We can pretty much say that everybody that does the work gets hired in the end because we don't quit on them. As long as they do the work, they will be happy, 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 and super, super successful. So we can answer Drake Caro's question real easily. Drake Caro asked to... Do you have any students who've got hired with just your recorded classes? Our recorded class program is brand new. So we haven't had a chance to get anybody hired through it. Actually, that's not true. Raul just took our course and got hired. Raul never made it to class. He And there's a video we made about him last week. Uh, Raul, Chris posted it to my channel. And Chris, you're muted. There, there's countless of people that have gotten hired from just our YouTube stuff. 
Like yeah, that, that's true too. Like we get messages all the time from people that have hodgepodge things together that have gotten hired. But uh, you're right. The question is, how long does it take that way? So, but but yeah, you're right. Raul did not attend any live classes and was successful. And I know that there's been a couple of more. I just don't know them off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, but I, we also just published the uh, video for Yvonne, uh, and I put the link there in the chat box. So, sorry, no, I just wanted to pop on screen because that that question about the recorded classes is it's very similar to people that do our YouTube stuff and tell us that they. That's know, true. Can, yeah. We get about one of them a week too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> As opposed to one every day from our students. So yeah, um, yes, we have had students that have done it. The answer is yes. But it's a newer program of ours. And please check out Romanek Ivan Tamba. Oh, God. 24 years old, graduated college, I think, a couple days ago, working at AWS. First tech job ever. He did not need to be an admin. He did not need to be an engineer. He was hired by AWS as a solution architect because he's that good. So please check it out. So, Clement, my team prop sent you a link to the course. My team will send you, send you a link to the to the uh, coupon code. Unfortunately, I can't stay any later, but I've enjoyed spending the moment with you. Let's get your cloud hired. Check out today's video of this wonderful, inspiring 20-something-year-old hired by AWS with no tech background whatsoever, but with good training, and see why AWS couldn't help but hire him. And when you see that video, you're going to know why. You're going to see the emotional intelligence, the energy, the enthusiasm, the passion, and the wonderfulness in him. And you'll see exactly why AWS couldn't help but hire him. AWS is really great. They don't care about your background. They don't care about your experience. They care about your competency, your emotional intelligence, your leadership skills, your sales skills, etc. About a year ago, one of the directors over there at AWS came on one of our coaching calls and said, can I speak to your class? And he said, here, I like the GoCloud career students for the following reason. They're not just techies. They're trained in soft skills, emotional intelligence, sales, leadership skills, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the reason why they hire him. So please check out Ivan Tamba's video. Check out Ivan Tamba's video. He's an amazing young man and see why he got hired. Chris, can you pop the link to that video in this chat box? And it's on our YouTube channel. Please check yep, it out. Yeah, we've been, we've been putting it in there. It's in there, it's in there, it's in there. Okay, well, go check out that video. Have a wonderful day, everybody. It's super nice to see you. Come join me on tomorrow's How to Get Your Fresh Cloud Job Open Air, and we can talk live on Zoom. You can answer questions. So see you tomorrow, everybody.